Um, I know this is a gratuitous slide. Uh, just we like to detail things. And that's my previously youngest daughter, Lucy. And uh, for no other reason, this is a swing pool, and this I put this in for uh, you students, in that you know you see these things thrown around in races. Now we did them on this building because there's uh, earth on top of this building and trees, mostly earth and and, uh, and shrubs. But there are a few trees that I'll get into in a second. And earth is really heavy. It's as heavy as concrete, 140 pounds a cubic foot when it's wet. And these 12 by 24 beams could not span the width of the pool. So we put a knee brace on them to reduce their span. But of course, the knee brace then takes this column and makes it want to go like that, wants to put it in bending. So then we designed these great fins, these steel fins that came up, take that load and drag it down into the ground. So these are real load bearing elements. In this case, my partner Peter, who always had great ideas, he wanted to bring a couple trees on the lid of this thing over here, and the engineer said, no, it's just won't hold it. So we put in a couple of columns to sit underneath each tree, just for the anomaly. And that's Peter. He's a brilliant guy. And we did get, we, we, I should say, as architects and designers, there's nothing like being able to sit around for a week and a half and just design the fittings, or design the fittings for a diving board. It's, um, it was sort of a pleasurable job. Uh, this is that swimming pool. This is the uh, what was going to be the swamp. And this, this is amazing. We, uh, about three years into construction, we turned the taps on. That is that all the groundwater that was coming out, we decided to run it into the estuary. And normally what you do for salmon, you have salmon here, but yours don't die. Um, <laughs> you know, our, ours grow up in a little stream, and they hang out in fresh water for about a year. And then they go out to sea, and about four years later, they come back, spawn, and die. And um, well, the, the lake, Washington, that this, this house is on, has become so much of a desert. The first year we turned the taps on, we had 85 mature salmon return, come up in, into, right into Bill's front yard and spawn. And this is, this is the school that came up right up into the estuary. OK. So now we're going to go through some projects really rapidly. So after Gates, uh, we learned a few things. And we learned that people respond to If we could get people to love landscapes the way that we saw them, and if we choreographed their movement on that landscape in such a way that they could see the most poignant qualities of that landscape, then perhaps we would convert them to loving the landscape. And I've chosen this particular project because the owner was uh, Ross Perot's roommate at Annapolis. He'd spent his whole life developing some bizarre anti-missile system for the Navy. Uh, he was the right wing of guys you could possibly meet. And um, he had an odd property that had a dip in it before it went up to a point and then had a spectacular view of the Olympic Mountains out here, but went off a cliff. And so when we went to survey, it was so dense because it was a third third growth uh, sort of cedar forest, that I had to get on my hands and knees and crawl into it in places. And when I got in there, I found that the center of it were these fantastic rhododendrons, 20 foot high forest rhododendrons. And we thought, wouldn't that be cool to experience that? So we came to him and we said, let's, look, we really, let's just do this bridge that gets the house up high enough for a view. And when you park, you'll come in here and you'll walk through a forest at a very unfamiliar level and we think that this will connect you to your landscape. Um, that's the bridge. Now, it, what's interesting, there's a garage on the property, too. And this guy loves his cars. He's a real machine gun. He has machine guns and things. And, um, <laughs> and he's, he parks his car out here in the rain because he just loves this 120 feet walking through the forest 15 feet off the ground. And all the neighbors come and hang out here. It's just. It, it has connected them to this landscape to the point where he will never touch that forest. And any owner of this building will never touch that forest because it is integral to the architecture. I even have him out there planting alders. He's, uh, he's been converted. Now, in the north, in, in any climate, buildings respond to climate. This is again for the students. We live in a damp, I live in a damp, wet climate, not too different from here, a little bit warmer, but 
not too different. Things rot a little bit more quickly, I think, in the Northwest. But it rains all the time. So the things that very often we want to hide in architecture, like <coughs> the flashes, the metal parts that actually keep the building from rotting, become important to us. They become the fundamentals of the architecture because they reveal and reflect the nature of the place. So when you put a flashing on a building, it protects different parts of the building from rot. You're not only honoring that wood, honoring that tree by not letting it rot away, but you're also reflecting the nature of the place of a built building. So they become not they, the flashings become the ornament of the building and driven by the tangible reality of the place. Now, I mean told a different story, okay? I'll try to do it quick. So uh, a few years, right, actually right about the middle of Gates project, we were doing a project, by the way, I didn't do this building. Um, <laughs> um, we were doing a project in southeast Alaska. And um, it was a carving center for uh, a, a small village because their most famous sort of um, citizen was a world famous artist, a guy named Nathan Jackson, who was a world famous, called indigenous artist. And um, he, because he was world famous, they thought, let's do a carving center for him so he can teach the children of our village and all of Southeast Alaska his craft. Because their culture, very much like your native cultures, are being overwhelmed by our culture and devoured by our culture, our materialist culture, I should say. And um, so in any case, we got hired to do the carving center. And we designed a little building. And about halfway through construction, <coughs> Uh, one of the white managers for the tribal corporation came to me and said, there's no money left. What's going on here? And I have to explain the tribal structure. There, there are maybe 500 people in the tribe. They own 30,000 acres. Um, but they always hire white managers to run their business. So the white guy says, you know, the contractor has really screwed up. There's, there's no money left. The project's not done. We had a grant to do the money. Uh, to do this project from the state of Alaska. And what we really need to do is we need to fire this guy and get somebody else. And I said, oh, I don't know, and I guess that's what you have to do. And, it, and it, so they decided they were going to fire him because he had uh, been, um, well, actually, we, we interviewed him. I remember this. We interviewed him and said, where did the money go? And he said, well, such and such an elder fell and broke her hip and we built a ramp into her house. And then such and such another elder down there, a big pothole opened up in front of his house and, and and, and we took all the machines down there for three days and cleaned up his property. And there's no money left. And so what? It, because it's a different culture we're dealing with. Well, the white guys in a sense, they wanted to fire the guy. And uh, the only way they could fire him, because he was the only person in the village who had, had been successful in the white man's world. He had been a uh, foreman on a crew in Anchorage and retired to the village with a pension. Only guy in the village with a pension. So it was a big deal to fire him. So they, they decided they were going to call a meeting of all the tribal elders to fire them. So the elders all come, and then the tribe had a, uh, a chief, uh, sort of hereditary head of the tribe, uh, a guy named Bill Williams. And Bill was this guy that I could basically talk to about the weather and nothing else. He just seemed sort of like a doofus. And um, that was smart. And, and so at this big tribal meeting, uh, Bill Williams comes out of his back room, flanked by the two white managers. And uh, he says, uh, he starts off talking. And he says, well, we haven't talked, the, con the contractor has not been organized, he hasn't done this. And, and he gets going, and about three sentences into his monologue, he starts to get paragraphs sort of crooked. And about two or three more sentences, and he's absolutely unintelligible. He's just saying words, and everybody in the, in the room realizes that he is literally trying to parrot something he was told two minutes earlier back in the back room by the white guys. And, and you know, it was embarrassing, and he got embarrassed, and, you know, he stopped speaking, and he was flushed. And, and then he waited for about easily 30 seconds. It seemed forever, just stood there. And then he switched from uh, our cadence to a native cadence, and he said, I feel bad. I feel bad that it's a white man's world. 